Hello and welcome back to Cinema Scalpel. We we discussed the films of Christopher Nolan, and I correct you on your wrong opinions about them. Uh, today we're covering the 2020 release Tenant, minutes 39 through 45 for the next two and a half hours. So settle in. Oh, before I get into that though, I want to announce that I did finish. Spoiler alert, I was going to leave this till later. I finished the 100 book challenge. And here's where I'm going to insert the uh, hooray uh, audio uh, sound effect. Uh, so you can all applaud for me. I'm going to go through the books quickly. And then maybe if I have time before I get into the in-depth analysis of Christopher Nolan's filmography, um, which is how, this, it's how we're going to do this channel going forward. It's going to now be a movie channel. Um, I'm never reading another book because I I read them all. There were 100 books and I read them all. Uh, okay, so let me... Oh, I got to get down to my reading list. 100 book challenge. Okay, so I'm... This is... I'm going to cover the last... Oh, jeez. It's not going to turn. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 books. Okay, the first three, however, are Larry more Larry Kent novels, and I already did two. I already did two uh, videos about Larry Kent. He's the Private Eye, the Australian Private Eye, the Private Dick who gets all the chicks. No, that's Shaft. See, I'm really thinking movies now because I'm done with books. No more books. Um, let me see. I got some screen caps here, though. Just get out of the file of. Batman Begins screen caps and into my collected book covers. So I read, let's see, the last three I read, I'll just go through them quickly. I read Spanish Harlem, um, The Heavenly Bodies, that one was good. He goes to L.A., shows, turns up in L.A. at the beginning of the book. He's a New York private eye. And then barely remember this one. This is a bit embarrassing. Hello, Dolly. Goodbye. Good title, though. And I think I had some other covers, too. I wanted to show these are, I believe there's about 20 of them available as ebooks on Amazon for $1.50 each right now. They also have the same publisher. I guess I didn't download one. Maybe it's in my search. Uh, the same publisher also publishes hard copies, and they do them two per volume, uh, which is a little more convenient if you like hard copies and uh, keep you reading a little longer because, like I say, the books are only about 100 pages long. Uh, I guess I don't have it anymore. There are some good titles in there, though. I kind of want to keep reading them, uh, but I'm not going to. Um, I just finished watching... A, a a video from Deb Reno Reads, and she said a lot of good things. She did kind of for a month and wrap up. I'll link to it too. Um, and it resonated with me a lot what she said. She said a couple things. She said she's garbaged out, trashed out for uh, on Garb August. I am too, although I still have at least one more book I'm going to read in Garb August after the 100 book challenge that I'm going to start tonight. But Oh, well, I can't really find the good ones, but it's a slightly different format for the for the print books. There's 20 Okay, so there's there's 24 ebooks and there's 12 print books which combined, uh, you know, two of the ebooks together. Uh, I like the I like the the tagline though cuz on the ebooks the tagline is, you know, the the most there's more. There's more. Uh, there's more of these than any other series. Over 400 books in print, or something like that. Something really exciting. But this one, Larry Kent. I hate crime. Larry Kent hates crime. Hence, action and adventure and crime fighting. Okay, so there's those three. I'm not gonna go into them. If you're interested in Larry Kent, look back in my history because my last two videos were all about Larry Kent. So I won't belabor those. Now I'll go to my list and see what else I read. Uh, did I mention The Key to Karen? I don't know if I, I mentioned that I read that one too. That one was really good. 
So those are the three Larry Kents. Oh, I, I read four Larry Kents since I last did a video. So I did the Key to Karen, Hello Dolly Goodbye, Heavenly Bodies, Spanish Harlem. Uh, definitely pick up The Terror Below if you want to read any of those. That's the strangest one. Okay, what else did I read? The Spicy Mystery Mega Pack. I also did a video about the first uh, story in that collection. Let me find the collection here. Lost the app again. It's, uh, no, that's not the app. Spicy, 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 spicy. I never use this, this shopping app that you can't actually order stuff on. Uh, the Spicy Mystery Mega Pack. 25 tales. This kind of slowed me down because it's about 350 pages, you know, print equivalent pages. And I've been trying to read short books to get over this damn challenge. As I was saying, Raynor uh, Reads talked about a lot of stuff. Uh, Deb from Raynor Reads talked uh, about a lot of stuff in her channel that resonated with me. Maybe I'll talk about some more of that later, but I really did because I'm thinking about the same thing she is uh, regarding challenges going forward because I think I spent too much time on challenges. Although I enjoyed them, but one of the, you know, reflecting back, I think one of the mistakes I made was doing a 100-book challenge and all these reading challenges because it really forced me to only to read a certain kind of book. And the 100-book challenge, which I don't think I'll ever do again. I might do like 10 books or 5-book challenge again. So the challenge for people who don't know is to read 100 books or a set number of books before you buy any new ones. And I also included in there a library, you know, not uh, checking out any more library books or, or just books that I actually owned a copy of on my Kindle. But I don't like to read that way, really. You know, and I do have a lot of variety, but it, it forced me to do a couple things. It forced me to avoid long books for the most part. Uh, I did read a couple long books. I read the 100 story collection of Ray Bradbury. I just managed, I just intended to dip into it, but they're so good. I just kept reading them. And Spicy Mystery Mega Pack, the first story was so hilarious. Uh, Death by Telephone. I did a video on that one, uh, which uh, broke all records, broke the internet. It's probably why you weren't able to see it. You, your computer's probably down because I got so many views. It must have been, you know, practically double digit review views on that. Um, and then, so I read a bunch of the other stories in here. I just kept reading them. Pretty mediocre, most of them, to be honest. Except this story, Batman by Victor Rousseau. Originally published in Spicy Mystery Stories, February 1936, under the pseudonym Lou Merrill, Batman by Victor Rousseau. This is a, an insane story. Starts out, there's a guy who's... Uh, very light sensitive and hiding in a closet hanging upside down because he's been turned into a bat. Why? For a very good reason because uh, his friend, uh, college roommate, etc., who's a, who's a research scientist, wanted to steal his girlfriend so he turned him into a bat so that he could have his, his girlfriend who is, of course, since this is a spicy, spicy uh, detective story, she happens to be a nurse. Anyway, so he's an evil doctor is his enemy and he's he's in the closet and he's uh, you know hiding out because it's dark in there and night he's he's simultaneously a fruit bat because he mentions eating fruit and and a vampire bat because he does later in the story try and swoop down and suck blood off his uh, girlfriend's neck or his fiance anyway this he's you know evil Roger Dean transformed him into this low form of life <laughs> by grafting his brain into the body of uh, one of his bats that he was studying. So, I guess he's got a big brain. Anyway, spoiler alert, uh, turns out he was never turned into a bat. He just sort of started thinking he got turned into a bat because he was, you know, had a lot of anxiety about his relationship and all that, and they promised to get him some therapy. It's interesting. It's a very funny story. I was going to look up when Batman was created. I think it was... The, the superhero character Batman was created by Christopher Nolan, um, the filmmaker, creator of Batman, co-creator of Batman with Ben Affleck. 
Um, oh, I just typed bat barman. Really not going to help. So when did Ben Affleck and Christopher Nolan create Batman? And his sidekick, the Joker. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Why can't this be on the first page Batman created? Oh my god. It's donation week for Wikipedia, so... Oh my god. Give me a break. Just give me a break. Ba okay, here we go. 39. So the story Batman, and I'm sure it's the only reason they included it, although it is one of the better stories in the anthology because it's, it's just so bonkers. A lot of the stories weren't that bonkers. Um, a lot of them were just basically, basically crime stories with boobs in them. Um, some didn't even have that many boobs in them. But that was one of the best ones, the Batman one. And almost all the stories in here were from 34, 35, and 36. And then the last story in the collection was from 1942, which is more like a war spy story. I'm, not, I'm kind of curious to why they included it, why they skipped ahead. It wasn't... Anyway, it doesn't matter. So, you know, it's possible, I suppose, that Christopher Nolan, uh, the original creator of Batman, was... Uh, scrolling through pulp magazines, old pulp magazines, and, and saw the title name. I should probably credit the real creators of Batman, Neil Hefty and Neil Adams. Um, you know, all, all these people, they all borrowed from so many sources in the pulp magazines back and forth. You know, it's probably, you know, I'm sure it's a simple enough t name to come up with. So they might they might have been inspired by this story. Who knows if they'd seen it in a pulp magazine. If uh, Bob Kane, Bill Finger had seen it in a pulp magazine. I think a lot of it is considered, well, the Joker is considered to be based on a, a, st um, a character in a movie called He Who Laughs, I think. Conrad Veet character, German expressionist film. Um, and one of the inspirations for Batman that I've heard of is the, the, the early old dark house noir film, The Bat, which is a pretty boring movie um, based on a play. It's basically just a shot, ver you know, a filmed version of a play super early, 1932 or something like that. But it's got a pretty interesting opening sequence with a model of a house and a camera swooping into the model um, anyway so I read that I read all of that that Bradbury book and that spicy mystery stories between the two I mean that Bradbury looks like 900 pages because it was 100 stories probably like 800 page. I think it's 800, 900 pages yeah um, so that took a lot of time away from not that I didn't enjoy reading those, but generally when I read short story collections, I can spend years on one short story collection because I'll just read a few at a time. So this was reading them pretty fast, the Bradbury. And, and like I've got dozens of those mega packs, and I've read parts of all of them. Uh, but I don't think I've ever read, I think this may be like the second one I've read all the way through beginning to end. I like to dip into them in that. Basically, I just like to buy them because they're so cheap. Anyway, what else have I got? Okay, so that was... Do, 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 do. Okay, and then um, this is... Depending on how you, what you consider Garb August or Garbology, I read a Ed McBain novel, 87th Precinct. I didn't really count this towards Garb August. The Con, Mad, the, the Con Man, the fourth or fifth Ed McBain novel. I've got them all. I've got like 45 of them, I think, on my Kindle because I would always uh, buy them whenever they uh, take one down to 99 cents. They're usually 2.99 or 3.49. Whenever they'd bring the ebook version of one or two down to 99 cents, I would buy it. I check like every couple of weeks obsessively. Now I have Kindle Unlimited, and they're all on that too, so I didn't really need to own any of them. Where is it? The con man. I guess I don't have to show you this cover. 
you know, they're kind of generic, these, uh, these Kindle reissues. Let me get back to my, so I can see where my lens. There's Ed McBain right there. Handsome, rugged guy, rugged uh, writer, you know, mid 20th century writer looking guy. Not his real name, of course. He, his real name, actually, I don't even know if that's his real name. His first book was under the name Evan Hunter, Blackboard Jungle, which people might know was a movie uh, with, Sidney, with Vic Morrow and Sidney Poitier and w played uh, juvenile delinquents. The hero was Glenn Ford. He's a idealistic, you know, there's movies like this come out all the time. During the 80s and 90s, movies like this came out all the time about the idealistic teacher who goes into the inner city and turns all the kids around. And this is uh, from like 1950 or something. It had Rock Around the Clock was the was the uh, uh, song that played over the credit sequence. We, we saw it in school. We loved it. I saw it in a film class in school, in high school. We all loved it. Very exciting movie. Glenn Ford, of course, great actor. Vic Morrow and Sidney Poitier. I think it might be Sidney Poitier's first film or very early. They play teenagers. Vic Morrow plays the... the, the, uh, the unredeemable uh, juvenile delinquent and Sidney Poitier plays the redeemable juvenile delinquent. Uh, Love all those guys. I can't remember who played the chick that he likes who's a librarian who gets assaulted. The con man was good. There's something about Ed McBain. I don't know how he came up with this, and I should probably know because Ed McBain was, was very generous in writing uh, prologues and afterwards and articles and everything about his book. But I wonder how he came up with his particular writing style, which was or the st storytelling style, I should say, for these 87 precinct stories, because they're not conventional. They're very, they're almost experimental. You wouldn't notice that or object to it when you're reading them, but they're, they don't have one plot. Like this one, the con man, there's two different plots going on and they don't connect. Or maybe they do in this one. Most of the time they don't connect. Or, uh, you know, there's, there'll be like a, sort of a, you know, it's almost like a, a period of time that's being carved out of the 87th precinct where you see different cops do different parts of the job of the precinct. I think he called it the splintered protagonist. Instead of just one cop being the hero like Columbo or two cops like most shows, you know, this is probably more the form that became, would become familiar with uh, television today, you know, where there's a lot of different characters all doing part of their job. You know, maybe Hill Street Blues is probably inspired by it a lot. And anyway, it's pretty unique in books. They're 87th Precinct novels. They're not novels about one or two particular cops who work in the 87th Precinct, although there are recurring characters. And there are there is a character, I forget his name, that publisher made him bring back. He killed off in the second or third book. Publisher said, you can't kill off that. He's like the main guy, isn't he? And he's like, well, I was not really thinking there wouldn't be a main guy. So he brought that character back. Can't remember his name right now. People will know. Anyway, it's a great series. Uh, he's just, you know, he's just Ed McBain, Evan Hunter. It's one example of one of those people that are, you know, some writers are just better than others. He wrote a lot of books. It wasn't like... You could say, well, maybe his books would be better if he slowed down, or, or, or anything like that. You know, certain pro prolific authors get a bad rap. Uh, you think their books might be better if they spent more time in, on them. Like Stephen King, I, I know this is. I complain about him all the time, and I'll stop after this video. But, and this is going to sound like an incredibly stupid. Point, but I'll say it anyway because it's my channel. Stephen King writes like he's making it all up as he goes along, and I know that when people write, they make it all up as they go along. And I'm sure that Ed McBain probably only wrote one or two drafts, like another writer I'm going to talk about later. 
Barry Malsberg and many others but his, his results are just better in my opinion okay so speaking of people who are very prolific this is a, this is a series this is now we're back to Garb August let me find the cover here this is now I'm getting into sex books I guess that's what you call them I don't know what you really call them okay because they're not really porn but they're they're men's paperbacks not not necessarily just men but paperbacks from the 50s and 60s that were lurid I guess you'd call them that had a lot of sex appeal or were meant to um I've rarely found one that's really effective on that level though they're just kind of comical I think this one is meant to be more humorous this is the 12th book in a series Lady, The Lady from Lust, book 12, Laid in the Future, Rod Gray, which is a pen name of Gardner Francis Fox. He wrote about 150 books, apparently, you know, in addition to writing, to going to work in the morning and writing uh, The Flash and Hawkman and Justice League, which were all characters he created, all books he created for DC Comics, then he would go home at night and he would write a couple of great series of sword and sorcery novels, which are pretty good. You know, they're... Let's see if I can find those to show you the Gardner F. Fox, which I really like. Here, Well, here's, here's a couple of them. Kothar was one of his barbarians. I guess I don't own the other... What was, his, what was his other? This is not the best series, but you can get the. Oh, Lord, every time I turn my screen around, my it goes to my last spot instead of the cover. These are mega packs too. There's two Go Kotha the Barbarian mega packs. These, so these are you get for a buck or so each. I really recommend these. A lot of these stories were adapted by Roy Thomas into Conan stories for the. For the uh, for the Con for the Roy Thomas John Buscema run of, of the Conan comic originally, and that's how I first heard that there was such a character. Okay, oh Kothar is okay. Here's okay. So this Kothar series ran in the '60s. Kothar the Barbarian Swordsman, Kothar of the Magic Sword, Kothar and the Demon Queen, Kothar and the Conjurer's Curse, and Kothar and the Wizard Slayer. Those are great. And these Kyrick ones, there was another, another series in 76 where he banged these four out in one year. Um, they're connected stories. As far as I remember, he's, he's, there's an overall quest. They're kind of like proto-Elric stories, meaning a precursor to Elric. Not nearly as good as Elric, but they're definitely worth picking up if you're a sword and sorcery nut. And, you, and if you're a sword and sorcery nut, you probably already have. Anyway, he wrote a lot of other series... Particularly, he wrote a lot of, in this era, this is 1972, he wrote a lot of James Bond sex ripoffs. The Lady of Lust is an Eve Drum secret agent on, an, on a sex truck, finds herself in a weird unisex world, laid in the future. Oh, here's a picture of Garner Fox, probably. Who, who would have drawn that? One of my comic book friends will know who would have drawn that. I'm sure it was drawn to be used in some kind of publishing material for DC Comics. He was a really important figure in the Silver Age of Comics, one of the most important. And, at, you know, speaking of people who wrote a lot. So anyway, a few years ago, his family, someone someone got the rights together, started putting his books out as e-books. You know, almost all of them were done under a different name. Those sword and sorcery books, I think, were under his own name, but all these sex books like this. Now, this uh, this Lady from Lust thing. Okay, we got to go into this. I read one before. I think I read the first one. I think a lot of these are on Kindle Unlimited now, too. And I remember buying this one because all the others were two ninety nine, And this one and the first one were $0.99. Cents. So... She's an agent. Her uh, 
code number is zero double O sex because she's so sexy. Uh, okay, her boss is the general, and she works uh, for Lust, the, the League of Underground Spies and Terrorists, which is a bible of the CIA with a little mis- mixture of the national security agency thrown in for good measure. Okay, at this point in the series, they have discovered uh, the future. Okay, so they uh, basically she has in the, the previous book, or more likely between books, pretty much solved all the uh, political crises in the world with a little help of the fact that they have discovered alien invaders from the future. A purple disc had come from the year 3693, at least that's what the voice claimed. So anyway, there's this purple disc message from the future. They want help from the past. Kind of a reverse uh, Terminator thing where they have a limited ability to bring somebody through time instead of sending a robot killer to the past. They want to bring someone from 1972 to the future to help them solve their problem. Who do you think they want? Eve Drum, the super spy. Because even 2,500 years in the future, it's well known that Eve Drum was the best spy and she and she uh, solved the Cold War, even though apparently there's still three blocks. There's, oh, I see. In this, in this part of the story, China and Russia are fighting each other and everything else is aligned with the United States. Anyway, so they want her and because uh, she's the best spy, but they also, because she's the right height and weight for their transportation device, uh, she's the only thing who can come through, no weapons or anything. But of course, you know, she does it. She goes to the future. She goes to 3659 or whatever year it was. Quite a departure in the series. All the other books, remember, are just uh, are just regular spy books with a lot of uh, sex in them. There's kind of a sex plot here, like a parody, like sort of an Italian farce movie or something. When she gets to the future, she finds that there's been this radiation cloud that's covered the earth, which has made everybody neuter or unisex, and so there are no men and women, except then she goes to a valley, which there are men and women, mostly women, a few men, um, who are being drugged, you know, who are being ostensibly there trying to repopulate the world because the neuter people, which is most people, can't have uh, procreation, but someone's, uh, you know, giving saltpeter to the men so that they don't want to have sex. There's only been like 17 babies born in decades or something like that. So she's got to work all this out. Plus, you know, have sex with uh, some of the folks that she meets. kind of marked one other part. Anyway, it all works out. Uh, she even manages to go back to the past after she solves all the problems in the future, um, leaving the series open for her to, to have more, uh, um, you know, spy-type adventures. So this is, I think, quite a departure in the series, probably why it was only 99 cents and the rest were more expensive. But it's pretty silly. It's meant to, like... You know the 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 sex and the mores and all all those kind of things, like that. The only thing I could I could really compare it to is the Woody Allen movie Sleeper. It's more like that than uh, any kind of serious thing or any kind of titillating titillating thing. Speaking of non erotic erotica, oh, I think I have some photos of that. And then so what else have I got? Con Man. Okay, so one more book to talk about, and I was not going to read this because I had had enough of Malzberg from those Wolf Lone Wolf books. This is getting too long, but I'll try and speed up here. I am on the last book as soon as I see any of these covers. <laughs> Oh, here's. I just want to show you these co- covers of Laid in the Future, The Lady from Lust. This was probably a later reissue where they didn't number them, where they tried to just pass them off as standalone books. Not that it would really matter. And here's one. Okay, now the ones I have, since it's book number 12, 
in this series, I th this looks like a British cover. I'm pretty sure it is. It's number 13, so I don't know if they, you know, if one of the earlier books in this numbering is a later book or if there's one missing or something, but Rod Gray, late in the future, in the weird unisex world of the future, Eve tinkers with the shape of things to come. And what's the tagline on this one? Eve Drum. That's a pretty terrible name. Eve Drum. It's like, what is it supposed to be a parody? Uh, what is it supposed to be a, a parody for? The Lady from Lust seems like a parody of The Man from Uncle and The Girl from Uncle. You know, there's a lot of series at the time that had those stupid sort of, uh, you know, um, initials, you know, like Specter, Schmerz, Specter. Eve Drum's secret agent on a sex trek finds herself in a weird unisex world. So they got sex in there twice. Sex trek, so I guess, you know, this is uh, trying to tie in with the uh, Star Trek. Okay, now the next book. The last book, like I was saying, I did not want to read. It is officially number 100 in my 100 book challenge. I'm not going to have time to go over all my back thoughts on the 100 book challenge. Maybe I'll do that in another video. But it is a book called Everything, and it's a hard title for me to remember because I, I keep wanting to call it Everything Happens to Susan. I think it's called Everything Happening to Susan. I really want to find the cover, though, because I like those Lone Wolf books I read by Barry Malsberg. It's by Barry Malsberg. It originally appeared under a pseudonym. I don't think I, I guess I didn't. Yay, yay, yay. Um, but unlike those Lone Wolf books, which were done straight, those 14 Lone Wolf books, of which I, I think I ended up reading six or so, which were like politically right-wing, intended to be violent, written specifically for a male audience. Um, and done straight you know it's about a guy who's killing drug dealers and that's what he does and there's no parody element this is the copy i have he has a new publisher now he has a new re reissue publisher stark house press so they've probably changed the cover again already but this gives you sort of an idea it's like you know if you're familiar with those like lawrence block books that he brought out, self-published a few years ago, that were all written under female pen names that were kind of like sex hippie books. Uh, you know, usually set in Greenwich Village and, you know, free love in the early 60s, arty hippie girls and stuff. That's basically what this book is too. But it's written like a Malsberg book. It's written like... His science fiction books, just there's no science fiction. Not to say that all his science fiction books actually had science fiction in them. One of his what, m most admired still books, Hervioit's World or something like that, Hervioit's World, is about a pathetic wretch of a hack science fiction writer banging out science fiction novels about his like Captain Future type character who eventually goes nuts and thinks this character that he writes about is trying to stalk him through New York City um, and kills him, or he becomes him, I don't remember. But this book by, uh, by Barry Malsberg is a, a kind of a serious novel trying to pass itself off as a, as a cheesy sex book. And I really don't think it did well it's got sex scenes in it, and they're Malzberg sex scenes. So if, if you've seen my other videos about Malzberg, he's like monument, Olympian level, unerotic sex writer. Like his sex is always comical and embarrassing and awkward and painful and humiliating for the male uh, protagonist who can barely perform kind of what this book is like so and the plot briefly briefly is this girl susan woman young woman susan trying to make it as an actress uh, can't do it 
decides to take a job in a porn movie. She has a boyfriend who's a wretched, loser, pathetic writer who works in the patent office or something like that all day and then slaves away on his novel at night on his typewriter. She starts working on this sex film with this director who's kind of like, kind of like, I think, kind of like, I guess the closest thing I could think would be like the people that are in Boogie Nights, kind of like where he's... Uh, He's a porno director, but he has an idea to do something more, and he's has it in his head. This porno director in the in the book that you know. Well, we've really done everything. And remember, it's like 1972. We've really done as much as we could do in porno. So, in within two years, either porn's going to be a true art form, or it's not even going to exist. So, I'm going to make my magnum opus, the history of the world in sex scenes. <laughs> So he's shooting this insanely long movie about sex scenes with horrible, you with historical figures. Like so, every day she's in a sex scene. Uh, you know, people dressing up like Abraham Lincoln or whoever, or Napoleon or whatever. It goes on and on and on. And but it's it's like sixty chapter. No, I guess it's more like forty five chapters. They're all like vignettes, and this is where it really reads like a Malzberg novel, like. Uh, a galaxy called, called Rome or uh, Beyond Apollo or any of those really late experimental Bombsburg films where it's just kind of disjointed cuts and just moods and, and feeling and uh, just sort of impressions, very impressionistic novel. She keeps going through the scenes, you know, uh, she's... Oh, wait, this version is called It Happened to Susan. You know what? I think this is the wrong book. I Google. I Google. I was looking for an old uh, thing, um, and I and I was going to say how this book seemed like they tried to reposition it as a romance novel, but you know, Jane Blackmore, I'm sure, is a pen name for somebody. Malzberg, of course, didn't have his own name on there, but I don't think. That Malzberg book is called It Happened to Susan, is it? I think that's just a book with a similar title. Because this is, this was called Everything That Happens to Susan. Or, see what I'm saying? It seems like it should be called It Happened to Susan or Everything Happens to Susan. Seems like a, a title for a, a, a book of this era. You know, it's kind of a hangout and be artsy in Greenwich Village in the 60s and 70s and free love kind of book. Anyway, I'll try and get back to the cover that I have for it. Everything happened to... So It Happened to Susan was nothing. Forget that other book. That was nothing. So I know even less about this book than I thought. I don't know if it came out under his real name or not. Everything Happened to Susan. Everything that happened... It's That's what happens in this book. It's the list of everything that happened to her in this time period. She uh, reads her boyfriends, they don't really get along very much. I don't think they're sleeping together even when the book starts, but they're still living together because of rent or whatever. And he's just typing, typing, typing. And, you know, there's a lot of meditations on art and what you have to do for art and all this. And, you know, she's trying to consider her porn career, acting, and this nutty director is trying to, you know, convince himself that he's creating a great timeless masterpiece when it's just a connection of like bad costume sex scenes one after another and there's like and she, I think she does like 40 of them or something I mean they're not all described there's not that much graphic sex in this but it's like every day she goes to work and there's a new sex scene and the, the movie's going to be like 40 hours long or something God knows coming toward the end a very Malzbergian moment where the last historical scene is going to be Dealey pa pa Dealey Plaza, Dallas, November 22nd, 1963. Doesn't mention the particulars. He's a little more discreet there than he normally is in his books where, as people who read Malzberg, Malzberg science fiction a lot, you know, know the, the JFK uh, assassination comes up all the time in his books. He's obsessed with it. Um, she reads her boyfriend's book at one point, or at least what he's got done. It makes no sense. It's just artsy, gibberish. She feels she has to tell him. kind of breaks his heart. So I think he breaks up with her and moves out. Then he goes to see her at work. 
and they're like, uh, your boyfriend's here. And, he, and, and she's like, well, he's not really my boyfriend. And then it kind of stops. So that's it. I think he got to 200 pages and he was like, okay, so now the next thing will be Dealey Plaza and we're not going to explain if it's like going to be a snuff film or, or whatever God knows is going to happen in it. And it ends. But it, I think it's worth reading if you're a Malzberg freak. Um, and if you are, you know you are. So it's really fits in more with his with his <clears throat> with his respected body of science fiction work, you know, whereas opposed to those lone wolf books are really not anything. They're just they're just work. This one he tried to pass off. He tried to write a Malzberg novel and pass it off as a sex novel. And I wouldn't say it's perfect it's it's you know, it's curiosity. So that's everything happening to Susan or see I forgot the name again already everything happened to Susan I found on by looking you know for the more recent version of this and everything online on Kindle that the same publisher that Stark House also has several Malzberg story collections like one collection of all his collaborations and he's more than anybody I can think of written more stories short stories in collaboration with other co-authors most of them with Bill Pronzini the mystery writer a lot of them with Kath Koja the uh, horror writer who uh, who wrote uh, Strange Angels which I reviewed back in Horror Month on this channel and these are like three or four, you know, 3,000, you know, 10, 12 page stories. I don't know what, how the collaboration goes, but he wrote many like that. And I think they have at least two or three Malzberg story collections. And I think he is really a master short storyteller. Even his novels, which are always pretty short, around, you know, 150, 100, you know, 200 pages, except for, I think, one exception. You know, and he wrote them very fast, and he wrote them one draft, and he turned them in, and, he, you know, he repeats themes a lot. Even them, they read, like, uh, short stories. I think he just stopped writing them because he just got too old for that kind of pace. He's still alive today. I think he's 85 or 86. He still writes short stories sometimes. Hasn't written a novel in many years. Uh, I think he just composed that, you know, a crazy Benzo, Peyton, you know, imagine writing these things on a typewriter and typing them out of one draft carefully enough that they could go to a typesetter. You know, there's many, many such cases, as they say, as uh, the 45th president of the United States uh, loves to say, many such cases of people doing that. And, of course, many people uh, writing just massive amounts today which is which I'm going to talk about in my next video because what I'm going to do in in September one of the things I'm going to do is take advantage of my Kindle Unlimited to read a few to read on a few popular series of self-published popular genre series in a couple different genres that seem to be wildly successful that no one in the mainstream no one outside of the self-publishing outside of the Kindle world knows about or cares about these books are not ever going to get Hugo's they're not ever going to get reviewed in Locus magazine the writers aren't going to get published have short stories published in Asimov or anything it's a completely separate world but they're making money and they've got and more importantly they've got massive massive fans I really don't know how much money they make because you know they have to foot all their own costs too you know, I have to pay for editing if they do that. Covers, advertising. You know, I'm, I'm still on Facebook, and I get in, and because I clicked on a few um, Kindle book advertisements, now that's all I get. You know, I am inundated with really crappy generative IA covers of guys who are supposed to be Jack Reacher imitations with six knuckles on one hand and or guys who are supposed to be cowboys who look sort of like Lee Van Cleef you know but they've got a hat with a brim that's two sides on one side because it's a crappy uh, uh, AI generated cover and I click on those things just because they're so absurd. But I did find some 
authors that seem to be have really big following so I'm gonna try some of them out I don't know where to start with I mean some of these series are like 30 40 50 books a couple of them are well over 100 books they've been running since 2017 or anything and people just keep pumping out the series so there are people writing a lot of books today of course where the word processor and everything it's got to be a lot less insane I'm just rambling okay that was it 100 book challenge Sorry, I didn't have time to get to minutes 39 through 47 of, uh, of Tenant by Christopher Nolan and tell you exactly how to th interpret them for yourselves. Or not for yourself, never do that. Just take my interpretation, uh, but we'll do that next time. Okay, we're done.